Which hot list is taking the pioneer crown? Let the rebellion break it all down. It only counts if it mounts. Comment below as we walk through the week 13 recap of Outlaw Pioneer. Alrighty gang, in tier 1 land, Abzan Amalia is back and leading the charge after an off week or two. Amalia racked up 19 top 8s and 4 trophies across 10 tournaments, putting on a dominant performance. Right behind it, Rakdos Vampires with 22 top 8s but only 2 trophies across the same 10 tournaments. Finally, Is It Phoenix rounds out our tier 1 archetypes with 8 top 8s and a single trophy to its name. I mean, Max combined these three archetypes took up 49 top eight slots and seven trophies between them out of 80 total top eight slots in 10 tournaments. That is dominance at the highest level. Yeah, it is. And in tier two, tier two, we start with a green devotion, which quietly managed six top eights, but not a single trophy. Uh, next was the Rakdos Souls variant featuring Tree of Perdition combo, snagging four top eights and a trophy. Last but not least, Azori's control did manage four top eights as well, though it failed to clinch a first place finish. And over in Brewer's Corner, we've got Enigmatic Combo, Jun Citadel Combo, Azorius Combo, and Mono White Midrange to talk about this week. Oh yeah, now onto our tier one archetype breakdowns, beginning with Abs and Amalia. Alrighty, so Crazy Marengo took down a 68-player MTGO challenge this past week with Abs and Amalia, continuing the comeback tour of a combo everybody loves to hate. Now, at this point, you should have a firm grasp on, on Amalia's overarching strategy, so let's take a moment to discuss what it looks to gain with Bloomboro. First, you gotta look at Dewdrop Cure. This is gonna replace Return to Ranks, I'm calling it right now. This is too strong. Like, gifting a card allows you to literally put the entire combo on the board and combo off for three mana. If you've got Wild Growth Walker, Amalia, a Lunark Veteran, just do drop cure, gift him a card, win the game. That's insane. Like, that's that's returned ranks for <laughs> two mana cheaper. That's it, just so much better. Now, Zorline Cosmos Collar is also potentially a great flex slot, and it pairs really well with Deep Cavern Bat. So I would look to see that get tested out as kind of a one of here and there in some lists. We don't know if it's strong enough yet, but it could be. And then of course, Darkstar Augur as double Bob. That might be a thing that we see. Yeah, actually this deck takes a lot from Bloomberg. I, I feel like it's gonna get so much stronger. Um, is this gonna be enough to push the deck over the top to the point that people calling for some bans might actually get what they want? Maybe. Honestly, um, <laughs> we, we saw it happen with Pod in Modern back in the day. You know, it wasn't like Pod was the most dominant deck, but it was extremely consistent in the hands of competent pilots. And we've seen that same trend with Abs and Amalia, where you put a decent pro with Abs and Amalia, and they're going to run circles around most archetypes because the deck has a lot of nuances to it. It's not easy necessarily. It seems like it's intuitive, but it's not. There's actually a lot of nuance to how you play and sequence things. But if you're good at it, Oh man, the winds just stack up, and this last weekend was proof of that. So yeah, it, it might get banned with the power curve going up. Oh yeah, we'll have to see when Blue Barrel releases. Uh, but talk to us about the next deck in our Tier 1, Rakdos Vampires. Alright, so Patsy snagged a trophy in a 35-player MTGO Showcase qualifier over the weekend with Vane Ripper and friends, proving once more that the Vampire Clan ain't nothing to fuck with. Now, let's talk about what they did differently here. This list eschews the usual 1-1 one, one Kalitas Shelly split and says, we want two Shellys, it's just stronger. And I get that if you're not as worried about the grave hate, Shelly puts on a lot of pressure in a hurry. We also note that this one pushed a lot heavier into that Rakdos mid-range plan almost with Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger getting pushed into the main. And there's a blot out in the main. Normally we see two blot outs in the sideboard, but they shoved one in the main. They cut down on go for the throats in the main. They cut down on Shieldred's Edict in the main. Uh, there's zero Preacher of the Schism, zero Arcfiend of the Draws, zero Bankbuster in the main. They really shifted this into more of a fast paced recursion engine with Kroxa as the secondary plan if Vayne Ripper doesn't push through. And I like that, honestly. Yeah, I have to say overall this build feels more, like you mentioned, like the Rakdos mid-range, Rakdos aggro builds that we used to see quite a bit. Uh, why this shift? 
I think in part because people are very prepared for Vein Rippers, and like it's still a strong enough game plan that you're totally comfortable going for it, right? And especially with game one, game one Vein Ripper, most people are not gonna have to pick your poisons in the main. So you're gonna have a strong plan there, but you need to have a backup. And I, I think part of that is what you see with that Rakdos Souls list that we're gonna cover in tier two in a bit, but this is the alternative path you can take where you say, okay, instead of trying to fit a second combo in, we're gonna fit in a second game plan and that game plan is Titans. So I, it makes sense to me, honestly, that they go that way as a backup plan. Yeah, makes sense to me too. I, I actually like this shift. Uh, let's talk about another deck in tier one land. Is it Phoenix? So Moon 11 smashed a 63 player MTGO last chance tournament last week with Is it Phoenix, highlighting the only trophy the archetype claimed. Now, this build in particular is intriguing to me because it includes a standard main board. There really isn't much that's shifted in this main board in, it's got to be months at this point, Max. Just not a lot has changed. But the sideboard, the sideboard is where the spice is. Now, they have two Anger of the Gods instead of the two Brotherhood's End. And let's note that in the finals, they beat it Artifacts, which is something that Brotherhood's End is traditionally very strong in. But apparently, it didn't stop them whatsoever. They still got there. And if that's the case and it's consistent, that means Anger of the Gods is going to be showing up everywhere, which is, I mean, fantastic news if you're trying to beat Amalia with Is It Phoenix, because that is one of the key cards in that matchup. Furthermore, I like that we're seeing this 2-2 split of Thing in the Ice and Young Jeezy, aka Young Pyromancer, <laughs> because it gives you a couple different options for how you want to control the game state and whether or not you want to go wide or if you want to punish people for going wide. So you get kind of that poker bluff especially in those open deck list scenarios where they're not sure which route you're going to go. Okay, okay. I'm uh, I'm also noticing here just the single Ash Yoke uh, and the two copies of Anger of the Gods. Are, is this enough graveyard hate to slow down decks like Amalia? Hard to say. Um, Amalia has been so dominant, especially, that I'm not sure that that's true yet. We might get to a place where Is It Phoenix is putting three, four Anger of the Gods in the sideboard and multiple Ash Yokes and saying... We're just going to do that. And let's note, too, that Anger of the Gods can be a backbreaker in the mirror if you time it right. You know, if you wipe yeah. out two, three of their Phoenixes, that can be the difference in the game. So I, I like that it gives you, there's like that tension point with your own Phoenixes. But if you play it right, I feel like it gives you enough of a power boost that you're willing to embrace that tension point. And we might see, you know, three, four Angers just as, all right, you know, you get your new return to ranks, but you're not getting a graveyard. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. This sort of choice requires a little bit more piloting uh, skill than, than previously. So yeah, I, I do understand the shift as well, though. Um, but that does it for all our Tier 1 archetypes. Let's go ahead and jump down to Tier 2, where I'll start things with Mono Green Devotion. Mandrel Man had the strongest showing with Devotion Green this past week, making it to the semifinals of a 68-player MTGO challenge. Now let's take a look. What did this iteration do differently? And then talk about new possible cards from Bloomboro. Um, we're going to have to talk about the sideboard here because a lot of the main board really hasn't changed much at all. Uh, we do have a lot of sideboard changes. Uh, we're talking about three obstinate bay loss. Uh, the hand hate is becoming just ever-present in this meta. So three obstinate bay loss to sort of punish that. Uh, going with a third tail swipe this week, to really serve as you know more key removal for the green deck i mean it, it's going to need that early game interaction uh and then of course two unlicensed hearses providing a stronger game plan versus amalia than what we saw previously i think unlicensed hearse is where you want to be in in mono green devotion also you know backs you up as a big creature possible cards from bloom burrow uh, i like fountain port as a one of as just a good mana sink value engine with nykthos i like keen-eyed curator most of all as a it, possibly two in the sideboards for the graveyard hate it's just a strong card overall graveyard hate plus strong body in ideal situations and it provides a really good mana sink that's fair now there are two questions i've got for you on this one max the first one we we mm -hmm. saw this 4-1 split with invasion of ixalan to oath of nissa it used to be that you'd see four oath of nissa maybe an invasion of ixalan maybe two at most but we now see the 4-1 split in the other direction is there a particular reason for that in your opinion yeah, I mean, you know, you, on the surface, you'd think the one cost card uh, over the two cost card, it does cost one more mana, but it searches just a bit deeper into the deck. And because it grabs permanence, it grabs a larger variety of cards, specifically artifacts, which, uh, you know, may come into relevance more and more uh, as we see green devotion evolve. But yeah, I think that's the primary reason there. And, and the second question here, and this list didn't have any white sideboard cards, but we've seen Tolsmere, we've seen Elish right. Norn, Mother of Machines. 
And in those lists, I'm noting that we're not seeing Temple Gardens anymore. We're just seeing the four ley line of the guild pack to give you that white mana post board. Do you think that's enough? Or do you think it's a mistake to not include a white source? Man, it's tough. Uh, that's a tough choice, honestly. I do think it is enough. I think it's working out for those players who are building it that way. Um, and let's not forget also that the card's main purpose is also to provide that broken start to the match where you you really get to ramp up with Nick Those You really get to have that devotion on the board right away. So I think serving that double purpose, I do think that's why you know they opted to go that route. Fair. And speaking of doing broken things, let's take a look at that Rakdos vampire variant known as Rakdos <laughs> Souls. Chi 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 took down a 48 player MTGO challenge last week with Rakdos Vampires variant Rakdos Souls. This dynamic two combo deck continues to shift as it's optimized this list, no exception to the evolution. Let's see how this iteration differs, then discuss possible new cards, because I do believe there are some we could add, and a good variety of them. Uh, we're seeing in this iteration two fatal pushes right away for more early interactions instead of being in the sideboard. We're seeing uh, Kologon's commands uh, right here in the sideboard. I think the purpose of that is just the the you know the variety of things that you can do, but being able to destroy cauldrons in the mirror, uh, being able to apply some of those other you know modes to the other matchups, the two damage to creatures matters. Uh, we're also seeing two damping spheres solidifying around damping sphere, and I think this is specifically for Is it Phoenix, specifically for Green Devotion, uh, being able to to render those decks useless in those matchups. Uh, let's talk about new cards, Stargaze. Uh, is one card that I'm looking at to enable the combo, dig for what you need. And then Infamous Cruel Claw, one of the new favorite legendary creatures. Uh, you can cheat a Vein Ripper on the board with this. Uh, you could activate the ability with Thrill Seeker if the board is clogged up and you can't get through at the time. So uh, being able to do damage to the opponent that way is, is a possibility with this deck. So Max, the big question everybody's going to ask, why would you play this instead of Rakdos Vampires? <laughs> That is a good question. I think when you look at this iteration, you compare it side by side with the Rakdos, Rakdos Vampires deck, this deck has a really strong early game foundation. Uh, it curves out really well. You've got the addition of Epicure in the one drop slot. Uh, of course, you've got Cauldron, then Thrill Seeker at three. This is a great curve out. It still provides a strong, aggressive game plan, regardless of whether you get the combo off or not, uh, when the two combos off or not. And so it, bad hands don't feel quite as bad with the Epicure, but also uh, this deck is kind of difficult to plan around. Um, you really have to try to tackle it in multiple ways post board, and you're not always going to get that game plan off and be able to stop this deck uh, from, from getting off one of its many you know possible win conditions. So I think that's really the reason. Fair. And speaking of not being able to stop a deck, let's talk about Azorius Control. <laughs> Love this name. Ivan Drago made it to the top eight of a 68 player MTGO challenge with the classic Azorius control build. Uh, let's see what this particular version of the deck did differently this week. Uh, we decided here on three portable holes, much needed early game interaction. We're starting to see a lot more aggressive game plans, early game game plans, and seeing decks shift toward that direction. So this is in response to that. The one hollowed moonlight uh, really to prevent that recursive uh, Amalia combo coming back, uh, you know, being able to resurrect, stopping that right away and decisively. Uh, we're also seeing two copies to change the equation. Very spicy. Uh, this does target quite a wide small swath of the tier one, tier two pioneer meta. Um, so I, I think that's why that's an easy include. And then one search for his Kanta. This is new, new this week, uh, really to dig late game, provide a mana sink that gives back plenty of value once you've tempoed your opponent. Uh, we're also seeing two Bermas in the sideboard, more synergy with Caracal. So we're seeing more of that cat synergy uh, in the deck. So, I mean, I look at this deck, it had four top eights, didn't grab a trophy, but it, it still managed to sneak into tier two land on that basis. And, you know, for everybody that's out there wondering why all these other decks that you may play are not sitting on the tier list, it's because they didn't have more than a couple top eight appearances across 10 tournaments. You know what I mean? Like if you can only get one top eight in 10 tournaments, it's not going to hit the tier list. So my question here is, this made it to tier two. What's stopping it from hitting tier one? I think we're starting to see just a few nudges uh, in trends. They're kind of hating this deck out just a little bit, right? Hand hate, pretty much ubiquitous. M multiple decks have hand hate in the early game. 
uh, duresses especially. Um, but diversity in the format, even though we're seeing a little bit of consolidation in the top tiers, like you just said, there's quite a few decks that could top eight at this point. So you, as Azorius Control, you're really having to look out for a lot of different archetypes and pick and choose according to varying local metas. Um, so I think that's one thing that really keeps this deck down. Uh, so just the general strength of tier one archetypes, um, they're getting to become more and more reliable. The combo decks are going off more reliably. Uh, people are seeing their ideal curve out. So yeah, that, that overall is just tough on Azorius Control in general. That's fair. And you know, speaking of diversity, let's talk about the brews. We can get to Brewer's Corner yes. and let's take a look at our first one here, Jun Citadel. Alrighty, gang. So credit to Chico Tech for this beautiful, beautiful list. Uh, for those who have not really played a lot with Bullets of Citadel, perhaps you haven't played a lot of vintage. Uh, it is all over vintage for a reason. But the point of this list is that you are very creature heavy. Obviously, it's a Coco deck. You are trying to dump out as many creatures as you can, kind of swarm the board, and eventually get to a Bolus of Citadel. We are going to just start flipping creatures off the top of your library into play, and you're going to have cards like Prosperous Innkeeper to give you life, along with cards like Mayhem Devil to take away and combo out your opponent. So it's, it's kind of a weird combo deck in a way because you are ramping all the way up to six mana to go off, but at the same time, you can win without it. You can get those hands where you just hit heavy with Mayhem Devils and Woe Striders, and you're just taking these critical pieces and you're grinding your way into that victory, even if you're not able to get to that main portion of the combo. I, I think it's got a lot of resiliency because of that, because primarily it's a Coco deck that just happens to have a top end combo, and that's so powerful. Yeah, love the Coco decks especially, but uh, having having that at the top end, oh my gosh, I, I, I want to try it out. Uh, but speaking of sort of your your grindier decks able to really go the distance let's talk about enigmatic combo the name of the game here is the value train uh we've got a combination of 28 enchantments and 12 creatures in the enigmatic incarnation deck uh that really help you go up the curve and in some ways ramp out towards your hm treasury towards atraxa uh, we've got Hiliod, Radiant, Dawn, two Moon Blessed Clerics that allow you to search for the enchantments you need to be able to do this. Full set, of course, of Enigmatic Carnation, the core of the deck, along with four Leyline Bindings that help you to basically sack those to go ahead and play Atraxa. Uh, I do love the one Elder Gargaroth, had to make a quick mention of that, that's a spicy card. Uh, Elish Norn, of course, boosts all your Enter the Battlefield, or now known as Enter Effects. Uh, we've got two Dovin's Veto, four No More Lies to really tempo the opponent, keep them down, along with four Chain to the Rocks for early interaction to really just tempo your opponent. Uh, combination of four Omens of the Sea, three Pass of the World Tree, help you to maintain your land drops turn after turn. Four up the Beanstalks to really provide value in the mid game. Can't forget Fable the Mirror Breaker, one of the best enchantments in Pioneer. And of course, it's a Sky Noodle deck. You know, why not? You can blink back in all your enchantments and. and crazy permanence i mean i've i've seen so many versions of an enigmatic combo there are versions with fires of invention there's versions without it just kind of depends on how you want to build it but i love that this one has that control piece early in the game and then it shifts modes and just goes over the top with value that's that's a work of art and doing it correctly with yeah. that kind of a mana base not easy especially when you're playing 80 card sky noodle decks <laughs> So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and with that, we're going to go ahead and move over to Azorius Combo. So credit to Yoshida Shintaro for smashing a Pioneer Tourney with this. Took it all down. And I really didn't know what to think because I have not had the pleasure of playing with Coveted Falcon, but I love that they combined it with Nine Lives. The ability to play this, Ooh. take a ton of damage off the board, and then just hand it over to them and then kill them. That's so spicy. I love that they went that route. And let's also note that like Coveted Falcon draws you cards when that you give them control of permanence. There's some permanence you don't mind giving them, like temporary lockdown. You don't care. They can own it. You can own it. Doesn't <laughs> matter. It's still going to do what it's going to do. And you get to go over the top to a degree with uh, Emrakul as well in this. So this is a really weird deck that almost poses as a control list when in fact it's just a combo list that's very slow and systematic in what it's doing. And I'm sure that, you know, Yoshido played against a ton of people that thought they were playing Azorius Control right up until the point <laughs> where they got comboed the hell out. Which, I mean, that's, that's what you want from a brew in particular is that ability to know that you're a week ahead of what everybody else is expecting. 
Yeah, I, I love to, to see these combo decks come out uh, in, in Pioneer and just get more and more creative week after week. Um, let's go ahead and shift now to Mono White Midrange. And I have to credit Athena the Bun, co-host on the Rebellion. God, she loves this archetype, so no surprise here. We've got, uh, it, it's just a, a value, a value game here. Four laydown arms, two portable holes for the early interaction. Uh, we've got Thraven Inspector and Ambitious Farmhand, along with the full set of Charming Princes uh, to really blink in that early value if you want. Full set of Bank Busters, because why not? Value Train. Uh, full set of Sarah Paragons. I think that's one of her favorite cards in Mono White currently. Mix that with the four Field of Ruins, three Roadside Reliquaries. I know Athena personally is going to miss those Roadside Reliquaries in Standard, so probably one of the inspirations to using it in this deck. Uh, we've got Emperor and Elish Nor in the four drop slot to really lock things down on the opponent. A lot of Pioneer decks depend on those inner effects, so Elish Norn locking that down. Full set of Steel Seros, uh, which notably can be blinked in with the Prince to become their full-fledged uh, non-prototype versions. Uh, I want to point out the two Elspeth Sons champions in the sideboard. Those are really great for the grind fests. Uh, and then, of course, this is another Sky Noodle deck, because why not? you got to blink in your Seraphs, your Emperors, and everything else while you have Norn on the field. <laughs> Sky Noodle forever, baby. And that is going to bring us to our final segment, predictions for the upcoming week. Now, Max, we looked at 10 archetypes tonight. What are our predictions going into week 14 of Outlaw Pioneer? So, it's no secret, Amalia is back and showing out in dominant fas fashion. With two additions from Blue Burrow set to hit in a few weeks. I don't think the deck is going away anytime soon, short of a ban. So, get your reps in for this weekend's RCQ. I mean, meanwhile, Rakdos Vampire, is, it's branching into two directions. The first pushes that traditional Vein Ripper and splits on whether you want to go Kroxa or Kalitas, and the second wants a second combo with Tree of Perdition. So far, to me, the traditional path has paid strong dividends, but honestly, I'm just waiting to see if somebody optimizes that Rakdos Souls list with trees because it's close. You can almost taste it. It's so close, but it's not quite there yet. As a Timmy myself, I, I really like that list and I want to make it work. But that really brings us to the question of whether is it Phoenix is going to evolve or just pick off unsuspecting sideboard plans to occasionally spike a tournament. Hard to say at the moment, but never doubt that the bird is the word. <laughs> and last but not least, we are seeing a rise in viable combo lists that aren't in the mainstream as brewers look to break open this metagame. So for those who think this is all solved, think again. Pioneer is deeper than you can expect, and Bloomboro is going to give us some new tools to mess with. Absolutely. Can't wait for that release. And that's it, folks. Another week in the books. Thank you for supporting us, and I want to give a special shout-out to our members who support our content. Comment below. Let us know what you think should be on the tier list for next week. We'll be back then with more analysis. Until next time, Rebels. Untap. Upkeep. Resist. Resist.